Okay, so we got, here's kind of what we got left. Uh, we've got our today and Tuesday is it for learning. And then the rest of the year we got things going on. So what, what do we have going on? Uh, how many of you are done with the essential skills requirement that you know of for sure? I just, it was on my transcript. Are those work samples? Yeah. So it's stop. so bad. Just stop right, right now. <laughs> just stop right now since it's not good. I'm going to do that. Just we want to get some tape for other people that are gone. Uh, so remember we talked earlier in the year about the fundamental theorem of algebra. We said, like, if I have a fifth degree polynomial, exactly how many complex zeros does it have? Got to have five. Right? Got to have five. Now, if I had, like, an x squared in there, then that counts for two zeros. But it has to have five. So we said, we, how many was the biggest number of real zeros we could have? Six. No. We could have all five. Real zeros correspond to x intercept. So we could have a fifth degree polynomial that's going to go through the x axis five times. That's five x intercepts. It's possible, right? That's very possible. Could we have, could we have four real zeros? No. How come? Ah, because the imaginary ones always come in pairs. They never come as singles. You remember talking about that? They always come in pairs. So if I have, if I, I can have zero imaginary numbers, but I can't have one, I have to have two imaginary zeros in it, right? So if I have two imaginary zeros, that leaves three real. So I get three real, two imaginary. Or if I have four imaginary, I only have one real, right? Or I could have five and zero. But I can't have, there's only certain possible combinations we can have. Okay, well here's why. It's this complex conjugate root theorem. If A plus BI is an imaginary root of a polynomial equation with real number coefficients, then A minus BI is also a root. They have to go together. So we know that zeros, that complex zeros, always come in complex conjugate pairs every time. Right, so they come in the form Whoops, they, they're always found in the form A plus or minus BI, okay? So if I get 2i as one of my complex zeros that has an i in it, well, that's 2 plus i. If I write it as a complex number in standard form with a real part. So it would be 7 it, subtract 2i. Well, it would be, it'd be 0 plus 2i. I don't write the zero, but, but 2i, really when we say 2i, what we really mean is 2i is zero plus 2i. We just don't write the zero. So what's its complex conjugate? Zero, two zero I. minus 2i, right? So what that tells us is if 2i is a zero of the function, then we automatically know that negative 2i is also a zero. They have to go together. Okay, so then all we have to do is the same process we did before. If I want to build a function from this, I'm just going to build a factor from each of my zeros. So if 7 is a 0, what's the factor? That's my assessment. If 2i is a 0, then what's the factor? That's minus 2i. If negative 2i is a 0, x plus 2i. Yeah, okay, and here's the good news. Whenever I get, uh, whenever I use conjugate zeros okay, and I want to build, uh, I want to build factors from those. Those factors are always going to multiply really easily because they, they multiply like conjugates. So x minus two i times x plus two i. Now look what that's going to give us if I multiply that out. If I multiply x minus two i times x plus two i. I'm going to get x squared plus 2i times x minus 2i times x. And then negative 2i times positive 2i is going to be minus 4i squared, right? OK, well, 2ix minus 2ix cancels, right? And what's i squared equal to? Well, i equals the square root of negative 1, right? So what's i squared? 
Well, I would just undo the square root. Negative one. Negative one, right? I squared equals negative one. So I'm just going to end up with x squared minus 4 times negative 1, x squared plus 4. In fact, it always works that way. If I multiply regular conjugates together, a plus b times a minus b, where there's no i's involved, I get a squared minus b squared. But if I multiply complex, con complex conjugates together, a plus bi times a minus bi, I always get a squared plus b squared. Easy. I don't even have to do the math every time. It just always works that way. Right? So in this problem then, when I'm, when I'm multiplying this out, I don't even have to think about this. I've got complex conjugates there, so I know I'm going to get the first thing squared plus the second thing squared. x squared plus 2 squared, right? Times x minus 7. That's easy. Just distribute the 7, distribute the x, distribute the negative 7, add like terms. You're done. Drop the pen, right? Yes. Okay? So that's good, right? These kind are actually, they seem like they're going to be hard, but they're actually easier. Okay? Okay, what about one like this? Okay, here's, here's another one that seems like it's going to be hard, but it's actually easy. It's actually easier than the first one we did, I promise you. So if we're trying to build a really simple polynomial function that has integer coefficients, right? Then think about this now. If I have a negative radical 10 in there, let's, let's build the factors from those two zeros. This one is going to be easy. x minus 1. What's that one going to be? It be x minus negative radical 10, so x plus radical 10. Well, if I distribute those out, Aren't I going to end up getting some square roots in my answer? It can't happen. I'm telling you, I want one with integer coefficients. I don't want any square roots in it, right? We're not done. There's a trick. There's a trick. If a polynomial has rational coefficients, meaning they can all be written as fractions with no square roots in it, nothing irrational, right? If it has rational coefficients, then it tells us essentially that irrational zeros have to come in conjugate pairs. Right? So if I have something like 0 minus the square root of 10, what's its conjugate? 0 plus, Zero plus the square root of 10. Right? So that means along with that negative radical 10, I've also got to have a positive radical 10. Okay? And what's, what's that going to give us for our factor? If the 0 is radical 10, the factor is x minus radical 10, right? Well, those are easy to multiply together. Those are the easiest kind because they're conjugates, right? If I multiply these together, I have a plus b times a minus b. a squared minus b squared every time. So that's just going to give me x squared minus the square root of 10 squared. What's the square root of 10 squared? 10. 10. Yeah. So I get x squared minus 10 times x minus 1. Distribute the x, distribute the negative 1. Add like terms, drop the 10. Right? You're done. Right? Okay? Piece of cake. Yep, you bet. Okay, so, so that takes us all the way up through the first half of the last assignment. Right? Here's the, I'm just going to push through one little thing here. This is so we can shorten what we have to do on Tuesday. Okay? I've only got a couple minutes, but let's just think about this. So we already know, I want you to see if you can see a pattern here. We just did this problem a little bit ago, right? We got, this is, didn't we get this answer? X, x cubed minus 11x squared minus 42x plus 360. Does that sound familiar? That was about three examples ago. How did we get it? Well, we started off with the zeros 5, negative 6, and 12, right? When we multiplied all that stuff out, think what we did. We distributed all this stuff out. Well, we are we know that we're, when we multiply these three factors out, we're going to get an x cubed, don't we? Because I'm multiplying an x, you know, x minus 5 times x plus 6 times x minus 12. So when I distribute these things out, I know that I'm always going to get an x squared term from the first product. 
And when I multiply the x times the x squared, I'm going to end up getting an x cubed for sure, right? The leading term of the polynomial is always going to end up being, of the final polynomial, is always just going to be the product of the leading term times the leading term times the leading term of each factor, right? So x times x times x is x cubed, right? Well, how did we end up getting our 360 if we go back a little bit? Look what we did. We got 5 times negative 6 is negative 30, right? Times 12 is 360. Okay, so we also always know that when we end up finishing the whole process, whatever the product of all, the, of all these zeros is, that's going to give us the constant in our polynomial. Right? Does that make sense? Okay, so now what if, here's my new problem that I could give you now. What if I said, starting from scratch, find all the rational zeros of this polynomial with no hints? If I can give you any hints at all. Well, we don't know any of the zeros, and this is not one that's got four terms, but if we try to do this one, grouping's not going to work. Because the ratio of 1 to negative 11 is different than the ratio of negative 42 to 360. So grouping would fail. So you couldn't do it. Or could you? Yeah. You, could. So you have an idea. This is, this, is a, if you, this is super cool. If you can get this, I'm super impressed. What numbers could we, we'd have to just kind of make a list of possible zeros and just start trying them all out until we, until we got a hit, until we found one that gave us no remainder. But we wouldn't have to try just every possible every possible rational number. Maybe we could narrow the list down. Zero. Okay, the two. 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 One. Two. Say it again. Two. Okay, well, it's going to be, okay, it's going to have to do with the 360, isn't it? Yeah. Right? Because the way we got the 360 was because that was the product of all of the zeros, wasn't it? Yeah. Right? So, so doesn't that mean that, that, go ahead, what do you think? Set it equal to 360? Uh, well, 360 is a possible answer, but it may not be that big. 360 didn't actually work. That wasn't one of our zeros. But the zeros were all factors of 360, weren't they? Right? Because they multiplied together to give me 360. Agreed? So it happened to be that the factors of 360 that worked were 5, negative 6, and 12. Right? But we could have at least narrowed it down wouldn't we know if we were starting with this problem that, okay, well, if I'm going to get rational zeros, I know that they have to be factors of 360, right? Everybody get that? At the very least, we know they have to multiply to 360. So why not just make a list of all the factors of 360 and start checking them off? That's a pretty big list for a number like 360, but it's still smaller than infinity. We still narrowed it down a little bit. You get my point? Okay. So let's go one step further, and this is, this is going to really get you thinking before your long weekend. You can take a whole weekend to kind of decompress from this. Right? But focus hard for, for just a second. This is good stuff. So what if, our, what if our zeros were fractions? Let's say they weren't even integers. They were things like 5 halves and negative 6 fifths and 10 ninths. Okay, well, if we want to build the polynomial from that, What's our rule? If x equals 5 halves is a 0, then x minus 5 halves is a factor, right? So we get the factors x minus 5 halves, x plus 6 fifths, and x minus 10 ninths, okay? But if we want to build the simplest polynomial, we want to build one that has integer coefficients, I can't have these fractions in there, so I just clear the fractions, right? I would just multiply the whole thing by 2 and by 5 and by 9. I multiply by 2 when I distribute that to the, when I multiply the first factor by 2, I'm going to get 2x minus 5, right? When I multiply the second factor by 5, I'm going to get 5x plus 6. When I multiply the third one by 9, I'm going to get 9x minus 10, okay? That's good. So now I got rid of all the fractions, and then I could just multiply this whole thing out. Well, to get the actual answer, we would have to distribute everything and collect like terms, and then multiply again and distribute everything and collect like terms. So we're not going to really know what the middle terms are, but we could, we could know what the first and last terms are going to be. The first term is just going to be the product of 2x times 5x times 9x, right? Well, 2 times 5 is 10, times 9 is 90, and 
then x times, it, times x times x is x cubed. So the first term is 90x cubed, right? The last term, the constant, is going to be the product of negative 5 and positive 6 and negative 10, which ends up being a positive 300, right? So if I wanted to work backwards then and find what the original factors are going to be, hmm, let's see, where did that 90 come from? The leading coefficient of the polynomial was the product of all of the denominators of my fractional zeros, right? The 300, the constant of my polynomial, when all the dust settled, was the product of all the numerators of my rational coefficients, right? So where does that lead us? That leads us to something pretty cool. It leads us to the rational root theorem, okay? Which tells us, here's what it tells us. That all of the rational zeros, zeros can be written as a fraction, of any polynomial must be here at 3.30. Please be outside waiting. Again, Gemini and Soli rise solely at 3.30. Also a reminder, no school on Monday. Have a great weekend. Go back. Okay, here we go. So last issue. So all the rational zeros of the polynomial would have to be fractions that are built with where the numerator is going to be uh, uh, coefficients of the constant, and the denominator is our coefficients of the leading term, right? Yeah. So we could make a list of all the, does that make sense? I mean, Tuesday. We got a head start at least. Now to go attempt to get a job. <laughs>